Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Two organizations in Arizona are teaming up to inform the Latino community about the Affordable Care Act and in Sounds of Cultura, SOC, an international festival showcasing Latino and Latin American contemporary artists. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. This week, Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius apologized for wasting consumers' time as they tried to use the website that allows them to buy government-mandated health insurance, also known as Obamacare. Here in Arizona, people are getting help to understand the Affordable Care Act through a partnership. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona and Chicanos por la Causa are reaching out to the Latino community to educate them about this legislation. Joining me to talk about this combined effort is David Adame, Chief Operating Officer for Chicanos por la Causa, and Diana Salazar, Senior Vice President for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. Thank you both for joining us on Horizonte. A lot of publicity this week about uh, what's gone wrong right. with the rollout of, of uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act. You guys are doing something to, to make it easier to do it. So, so um, uh, Deanna, just kind of give me an overview of this partnership, and then David, we're going to want to talk to you about some of the details of, of CPLC's involvement. So I'm glad you're focusing on sort of the positive things that uh, we need to do to facilitate implementation of the health care reform bill, or Obamacare, as sometimes it's called. So one of the gaps and deficits that we noticed in this market in particular is that we have a large segment of the population that's not just uninsured, but a lot of those uninsured are Hispanic. So we have over a million people in Arizona that don't have health insurance. About half of those people are probably going to be eligible for a subsidy or some sort of financial assistance to help them pay for their health insurance. And what we didn't see was a lot of deep understanding that went into the market to help people understand what their opportunities were to purchase health insurance products in the new market and under the new law. So we were looking for ways to make sure that we get the word out to people that there are those opportunities, not just to purchase. So everybody knows, I think a lot of people know that one of the big things that came with the new law was that there is guaranteed issue now. And that means that for individuals who go out and purchase products, you're not going to be turned away because of a health condition. So getting out the word that there's the opportunity to buy and then financial assistance to help do it was really important. One of the things that we knew we didn't have was as deep of an infiltration into the Hispanic market, not just in Maricopa County, but outside of Maricopa County and some of the rural areas. And as a carrier here in Arizona, we've been here for over 70 years. We serve the entire state. We don't want to ignore the rural areas of Arizona and just focus on Maricopa County. We're interested in every part of Arizona. We knew that a partnership with an organization like Chicanos por la Causa would help us get out into those markets and reach the segments of the population that may have a deeper need for education about health care reform. David, let's talk about that partnership. Um, Chicanos por la Causa is a statewide uh, yes. entity uh, uh, known more for your social services activities, and the education component of this makes a lot of sense, but, but this goes beyond that. Let's talk first about the education and then the business relationship that, that's coming about from this. Oh, absolutely. Well, Chicanos por la Causa does have four pillars that we work in. We do work in education, health and human services, economic development, and housing. And we've experienced different national rollouts, whether it's health care or whether it's home modifications. That was the problem a few years ago. Uh, and we saw that our community wasn't getting the proper information, which led to our community being taken advantage of, a lot of fraud going out there, people making promises to deliver something that they really couldn't, and charging our community above that. So we felt and that And I understand you've gotten some specific reports of people charging, what, $300 and guaranteeing people they'll yes, get Yes, we've already had people come in because they're taking advantage of all the bad news about the, the website having its difficulties. So they're saying, we can promise you something that they can't promise. So we've had those stories already, 300 bucks to pay for something that they can get for free and a service that they can get for free. So that's why we did it, and we knew that was going to happen. So we decided to do this partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield. We've had a long-time partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and it was a tremendous opportunity for us to work together using our experience and, and position in the state, their long-time position in the state, and to really help our, our folks find the right, because there's a lot of complications in this. There's, you have to apply for tax credits, there's, you have to look at the information. So we wanted to make sure that our community had all that kind of backup information. 
And like I said earlier, that we're already having troubles with it. With the trouble with the website, there's different ways that you can actually sign up for this. You can sign up to the website, which isn't working right now. You can do it through the telephone. And then you can also just do it the old-fashioned way. You can fill out a, ma a manual application and mail in. So right now, that's what we're really focused on. Until those other things are really flowing like they should be flowing, we're working on doing it manually and making sure that our folks don't get taken advantage of. Deanna, how are you getting the word out? And, and again, I do want to come back and talk about the, the um, insurance brokerage aspect of this, but, but, but uh, how are you getting the word out to people that this is something that, that Blue Cross and Chicanos uh, Por La Causa can help them on? So getting the word out has actually been really a challenge um, with respect to just health insurance in general. So this market in particular, the uninsured and the Hispanic community are less informed about health insurance in general. So it's not like we're selling sweaters from you know, a retail site where you can call up and say, what size do I want? These are complicated financial transactions that people need help with and they need help understanding. So we're having to be innovative and find ways to communicate with people that reach them in places they're used to being reached. So one example of that is we're going into retail locations where the Hispanic market is shopping and we're putting up kiosks to help inform them about fundamentals and basics with health care insurance with health insurance we're doing things like having public service announcements on media outlets that are more frequented by the Hispanic community so just basic fundamental PSAs about now's the time to educate yourself and giving them tools to be able to go out whether it's website tools subsidy calculators frequently asked questions that we've posted out there so that they can access those and educate themselves telling people when it's time to enroll so we've gone out with PSAs to tell them you have an open enrollment period where the you have the opportunity to go out and buy products for yourself and your family so talking to them in these media outlets that they're used to frequenting and seeing advertising from other um, service providers. And then we're doing some things that are a little bit out of the ordinary. For example, last week um, we held some telethons, some phone banks, where we went on to some media outlets and told people they could call and talk to somebody who could help educate them about health insurance and about health care reform. So we're trying to find innovative ways to reach this market where we haven't been really involved before. We've always been involved in the Arizona market, but not very specific in diving deep into the Hispanic market. So it's testing our innovation and the relationship with CPLC is one of the ways that we're helping sort of bolster that. Now, David, one of those innovations has to do with the creation of a new entity yes. run by CPLC that, that uh, uh, provides insurance after a fashion. Explain that one to us. Yes, so we actually set up a insurance agency. It's called CPLC Insurance, CPLC Insurance Inc. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to set up an entity that long term would be more beneficial to serve our community. And we touch about 150,000 people a year directly throughout the state of Arizona. And we felt that this was a better approach versus the money that was being made available by the federal government to help folks. And those are called navigators. The federal government provided resources that we could have applied for to try to support our community through traditional education and outreach. But we felt setting up this was helped us more strategically uh, educate our community because setting up a, a for-profit insurance company, we then use those profits to reinvest into the system so that we can continue long after this first go-round because this first go-round, you can, you can sign up between October 1st and March 31st, but next year it won't be as long a period to sign up. So we want to make sure that we're, we have a system set up that long-term strategically we can be in position to help our community for years to come. And hopefully we'll develop a model that we can take this to the other areas in the country that we've served with, either directly or with other uh, nonprofits that we partner with around the country. Now, Deanna, as I understand it, one of the unique things about this relationship is, is that it's an exclusive right. relationship, which is not something that Blue Cross normally does. It's not. So our broker relationships are very important to Blue Cross. It's one of the major ways that we get into the community to help um, Arizonans and our customers and prospective customers understand what their options are with respect to health insurance. So we wouldn't be as successful as we have been without brokers. This is different because CPLC, um, through this relationship, has agreed just to um, inform consumers about Blue Cross products. So a lot of P&C, property and casualty insurers, have these types of relationships where they have what they're called captive agents. So CPLC has agreed to do that for us. And for us that was important because it helps us really focus on this market and really focus geographically um, in the rural areas in particular where they have more expertise and they have the ability to reach the people in those markets. So it's a, it's a unique relationship for us. It's an extraordinary relationship for us. But the brokerage relationships in general are just 
just really important to us to make sure that we get the word out and we're able to get people into, um, into the carrier to sign up for insurance. Diana, on the side of Blue Cross Blue Shield, David Adama, Chicanos Por La Casa, thanks for joining us to explain this and uh, good luck going forward. Thank I'm you. sure you'll be more successful in the rollout so far. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The U.S.-Mexico border can be a contentious space shaped by the contrasting forces of two cultures rubbing shoulders. It's also a place that fuels the creative impulse of artists searching for an identity, as is the case with the music of Nortec Collective. AZPM's Luis Carrion reports on what makes the music unique. The music of Norte Collective was born out of the border dynamic of Tijuana. This group of musicians and artists is known for blending the traditional Norteño style with electronic club beats. It, it really became a, a federation, if we can call it, of DJs and VJs that began uh, playing and experimenting with electronic music. Javier Duran is professor of Spanish and border studies at the University of Arizona. He's also director of the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry. He says Norte Collective offers an interesting example of the blending of cultures along the border. From my perspective, what I'm interested in is to see how they negotiate the contradictions that we find in border regions, and especially in a place like Tijuana. I mean, the coexistence of a contradictory societal aspects related to violence, migration, uh, even our own perspective from the U.S. to secure the border is part of the conversation. The conversation being had here, says Duran, is one that includes the topics that are relevant to the communities that live at the point of contact between two countries. A point of contact that creates tension which translates into the sound of Norte Collective. They started sharing sounds, music, uh, also they start playing locally to wider audiences, and they supported each other with the local artists in terms of the graphic design. They were sort of part of what we can call a rave culture back in the day, and so that idea of being underground sort of remained part of this mystique, that they were locally uh, grounded, they were locally uh, produce, uh, and at the same time, they were reaching our audiences, especially in California and Europe. So it, it's an interesting mix of, 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 of folks working along the lines of Norte, besides the actual musicians. Indeed, Norte Collective is much more than a sound. And it's been said that if music is the soul of Norte, then art and design are the heart and mind behind the movement. A big thing with the Nortec is the visuals. Omar Pimienta is an interdisciplinary artist, a VJ, and writer who lives and works in the Tijuana border region. He says Norte Collective was part of a border aesthetic that gave voice to the bicultural experience of people living in Tijuana. And most of it is pretty much um, bringing in lower base community elements, taxis, the donkey, stuff that people weren't really proud of in Tijuana. It obviously made young creative people think about their city in a more critical way. And it gave them pride and tools to, I guess, unify more their creative process. Pimienta says the melding of creative sensibilities created tension. Traditional music genres being mixed with an invasive pop music sensibility did rub some people the wrong way at first, he says. It took a relatively short time for everybody to figure out that this was an honest attempt and that it was, that it made sense. And it wasn't a mockery, it was simply appropriation. And, and it, it, everybody, yeah, I, I could probably say everybody jumped into the wagon pretty much. The U.S.-Mexico border is a place where asymmetry and tension seem to define identity, says Duran. And Norte Collective provides a window into how a new border culture evolves. What I find interesting is the possibility of negotiation between the local and the global and what place the border has in this conversation. 
Duran says the conversation about the border involves many issues that change over time. A Norte Collective is only one voice in a complex dialogue. Now, it would be naive to think that this uh, sort of autotopia that is Norte in some ways would provide concrete solutions to some of the issues, but it, but it does provide a venue to better rethink what's being produced at the local level in our border communities on both sides. And what are some of the things that we can engage a younger generation to rethink the ways that we're talking about the border and how we're dealing or managing the border, so to speak. In Sounds of Cultura, SOC, the Celebr Celebración Artística de las Américas, also known as Cala Alliance, launched its annual Cala Festival earlier this month. It's a celebration of Latino arts and culture featuring a variety of visual and performing arts designed to encourage a better understanding among cultures. With me to talk about the festival is Myra Millinger, executive consultant to the board and former Cala board member, and Julio Morales, curator for the Cala Festival. Thank you both for joining us on Horizonte. Um, Julio, I want to start with you mm -hmm. in part because that video package that we just saw uh, has a lot of connection not only to the topic we're, we're, we're going to discuss right now and, and the importance of, of culture, uh, uh, cross-border cultural mm -hmm. events, but you know those guys. I know those guys. I'm from Tijuana and that whole explosion of music and culture that happened in the early 2000s came from embracing the local and embracing the music from your tradition, but also mixing in electronic music, so mixing in contemporary music with traditional music. And I think that's one of the goals of what we're doing here with this festival, is we have international artists, well-known national artists, and local uh, artists working together for the two-day festival that we're about to experience this weekend. Now, uh, Myra, before we get into the details of the festival, give us an overview of Kala, and I should mention just in the interest of full disclosure that I'm on the board. Well, fortunately, you pronounced the Spanish of the Well, names. I started to say it in English, <laughs> and then I remembered what I was doing. Um, Kala Alliance was established in 2010. It seems much longer than that. Um, for the sole purpose of shining a light on both our historic and our contemporary cultural ties to the Americas. And I think one of the uh, major goals and missions of Kala is to bring the depth of that relationship and that history and that vibrancy now to light in, in a better and a more um, a substantive way than perhaps has been done to this point. And our, our name, uh, is indicative of our mission uh, in that we are working very hard to bring together Arizona's Latino poets and playwrights and dancers and uh, visual artists uh, to find common ground together with mainstream arts and culture organizations to work to produce new work, to develop relationships into the Americas uh, that will change perhaps um, some of our own views of our Latino community's assets and contribution to the fabric of this state. And you're also bringing artists from all over the Americas to all participate. All over the Americas, yes. Um, obviously, we are in the early stages of what we hope will grow into, uh, in times, something we can be as proud of as Guanajuato is with the Sorrentino Festival. And this is the second major festival. It's uh, every yes. two years. Um, uh, what's different this year from the first one? The, the first year in 2011, it was a five-week festival um, that involved over 45 arts and culture organizations spread out throughout the Metro Phoenix area. And what Kala Alliance did was to consolidate and promote those efforts to create a unified sense of energy. Um, this year, we are doing that as well. We launched on October 8th uh, and will conclude on November 2nd, which mm -hmm. is this Saturday but by uh, a wonderful partnership that has emerged with the city of Phoenix, uh, we are now ending the Kala International Festival 2013 with a two-day Kala Phoenix Fest. And that is going to be concentrated in downtown Phoenix. Uh, the city has been wonderful in working with us, as has the Herberger Theater Center and a number of cultural institutions in the area. 
uh, to put together and to close off streets to create an amazing two-day event uh, that will uh, highlight our local artists in the Latino community, as well as a number of artists coming in from across the border. And Julio, the, yes. the, 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 this two-day Cala Phoenix Fest focuses on a, a very traditional uh, Latin American celebration, actually right. in other parts of the world as well, uh, Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos. Um, tell us about that and, and, and some of the performances that we're going to see. Sure. So, I mean, at the starting point, it does take um, into consideration the traditional Day of the Dead processions and other celebrations. Um, and then from there, we started to and, think... And we have, an, we have an image of the, of the procession mm. we want to put up on the screen, so give people a sense of, of some of the stuff right. that they're going to see. And as I understand, this is a cultural coalition that will be leading processions mm -hmm. both on, on Friday, Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday as well. And, and also from that as well, we're also working with international artists. And I, I should mention as well that I was here a year ago. And a year ago was when I first started working at ASU Art Museum as a curator. And you told me you should check out Kala because they're doing some really interesting work. Mm -hmm. And now I sit here a year later working with Kala and with you. It worked out very well. <laughs> it worked out incredibly well. And, and we've well. got, uh, um, as I understand, a big part of, of Friday is, yes. is music. And we've got some pictures we want to put up oh, on the right. screen yeah. re relating to a, a few mm -hmm. of those performances. And um, the highlights, well, you know, there's amazing performers. And, and this one in particular on, is? Yes, on Friday, sorry. And this is Cam Camino, uh, Camilo Lara, uh, Mexican Institute of Sound, which is an amazing band and musician. And in the last couple of years, he's just exploded. And he just came back from India, from Africa, from uh, Paris to perform. And he performs, and he sings in Spanish and in English. And his music is a hybrid of mambo music, hip hop, electronic music. And it's very danceable. And he's going to be performing on Saturday. And then DJ Lengua. And DJ Lengua is another internationally uh, well-known musician. Um, he's in Los Angeles, and so he mixes traditional cumbia music with electronic music and um, psychedelic music as well. And we've, we've got some other performers uh, who are going to be um, uh, performing on Saturday. I think mm -hmm. we've got a hip hop artist from Los Angeles and we've got a picture of her that we want to put up on the screen. And this is uh, Mayra del, del Valle? Yes, exactly. And did you want to mention Yes. Talk to her about it. Yes, we're, we're very excited that um, one of our partners uh, in Kala exists through partnerships, that's the alliance part of our name. Uh, one of our partners this year is Cox, and Cox has uh, a commitment to Latino programming, mm -hmm. uh, and they have um, uh, brought uh, Maida to us, uh, and she will be performing on our main stage outside of the Herberger Theater uh, on Saturday afternoon, and um, what we have heard is that she is extraordinarily vibrant and tracks a great following. And, yeah. and just to give people a sense of this, this is taking place in downtown Phoenix. There'll be several blocks that are yes. blocked off. Yes, we're, we're blocking off from uh, essentially First Street Adams up down mm. through following to the Herberger Theater Center. We will have a, um, a small stage on um, First and Adams that will be having performances Friday night and all day Saturday. Uh, and and we've then got the a, schedule on the, on and the then screen. A major, right. uh, a major large stage right outside because the street between the Herberger and the Convention Hall will be closed. So, Julio, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. we're almost out of time, but sure. I want to talk about some of the very special things that are going on. One of them is, is this uh, procession. You've got some Italian artists involved. We have some Italian artists. So, part of the ASU Art Museum is we have a residency program downtown in um, the Combine uh, International Residency Studios. And so they've been in residence a couple of times in the last year or so. And so this is basically the outcome of their uh, residency. And I'm trying to remember the name, but you have the card there in front of you. It's the, um, the, 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 the title, sorry. Can you read that for me for a second? Well, why don't you go ahead yeah. and describe it while I look at it. And so that. this is a collective from Italy called uh, Luca Fausto. And so essentially they're creating a Fausto, procession. Uh -huh. That begins at Third and Garfield, and it's going to end up in St. Mary's. And, and it has a special significance because of, of uh, deaths by automobile. Exactly, because one of the main um, accidents and deaths that happen here in Phoenix, and one of the leading causes of deaths, is car accidents. And so, essentially, their procession and their project is pushing a crashed car throughout we, the streets we, and we've got being less followed than a by a band. Left. So, I want to talk yes. about the, the ofrendas at St. Mary's yes. and also the video presentation. Ah, okay. So, at St. Mary's, in that beautiful courtyard that they have, we're going to have some local artists, um, um, 
create some installations. It'll be a variations on altars. And we also are gonna be having a series of projections onto the side of the Hyatt building by a Mexico City artist um, that Kala brought, uh, Tanya Candiani. So, uh, Myra, we only have a few seconds left, but, but uh, if people want more information, how do they get it? They should go on the uh, Kala Alliance, www.donkalaalliance.org website and click on Kala Phoenix Fest or like us on Facebook. And, and it's free, right? It's, it's free. free. Well, that's this the best news. This event is free and to thank the public. And thank you for joining us on Horizonte to talk about it. Thank you. That is our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.